Hello everyone, welcome to Black uh, Fucking White Comics. I'm here today with Simon Spiri, the writer of Alienated, Coda, Angelic, so much, so much, step by bloody step. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for, for joining me here today. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Uh, what what the uh, what the viewers don't know is that the, the gratitude should be aimed at you because you've stayed up till, what is it at your end? It's like silly o'clock. It's definitely bedtime 10, for you. 10 p.m. It's not well, too It's not bad. too shabby, but yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's it's the middle of the day for me, so I'm well caffeinated, so I appreciate it. For people who might not know uh, too much about you, can you tell uh, the people watching about yourself and some of, uh, some of your work? Yeah. Yeah. Uh... I mean, you'll discover very quickly, I could waffle on about that for hours. So the, the short version, I guess, uh, grew up here in the UK, where the only sort of homegrown um, non kids comic that immediately jumps to mind is 2000 AD, which is which is the, the sort of anthology, mostly science fiction title, which gave us Alan Moore and Grant Morrison and Mark Millar and Garth Ennis and all, all sorts of other fantastic talents um i didn't get to it till i was about 16 wasn't really into comics and then discovered it being an arrogant little fuck i immediately decided that this was something i could do and should therefore be the best at it and, and started sending in some quite terrible idea submissions which went nowhere for a good couple of years um i think the moment actually came when i realized that the editor was taking quite a lot of his time to send me advice <laughs> And I was just like, no, this is wrong. Uh, I was a very arrogant teenager. And then eventually when I started taking that advice, I started getting work. Um, and then that just sort of went blibbity blibbity blib up. Um, did a bunch of stuff for them. Got a few gigs with Marvel. Uh, at the same time, I was doing a lot of prose writing, uh, sort of publishing novels, and then started doing some odds and sods of TV work and movie work. And, and it just sort of all kind of swirled around and then uh, it's it's gradually sort of gravitated more and more towards a, a comic-y um, career, if only because you can't, like, the, the nature of comics, the treadmill of it all, the monthly publishing schedule means that you can't easily dip in and out. You know, if you're doing comics, you've got to do comics. And if you're not doing comics, then there's time to do other things. Um, yeah, that was a, a minimal waffle for me, but still quasi waffly. It was perfect. It was perfect. Um, I, I loved uh, Step by Bloody Step. I don't think I've read a whole series that's uh, been a, a silent series. You know, you've got the, the odd issue here and there that has been silent issues, but this is a, the first one that I've, I've read the whole series. Uh, what made you want to take on a project like that? Uh, just a challenge, I suppose. I mean, the, the, the artist, Matthias Bagara, um, he and I worked together on Coda, a few years previously and he just sort of for me came out of nowhere and almost immediately we realized that um our ideas gelled the aesthetic that he was bringing to the table was so perfect for the sorts of tone and voice that i was bringing to the table and we immediately became very fast friends and um i, I like to think that we will just continue to collaborate whenever we're able because we just sort of vibe right and that's that's without getting too sidetracked, that's the magic of comics, is finding those collaborations that just work like they were meant to be. Um, that said, as soon as Coda came out, and then he did some some bits and bobs of uh, the Sandman, the Dreaming stuff, and then he did some Hellblazer with me, just because I kept sort of bringing him in whenever I got the chance. Very quickly, it became obvious that he was being noticed by much bigger names than me, and he was gonna get an offer that he couldn't refuse. So. I sort of figured him being him, the only way that I was going to make sure that he was always saying yes to my projects rather than other people's projects is if I was giving him challenges that, that allowed him to sort of show what he can do to to make the art the, the star. Um, so, yeah, I've always wanted to do a, a, a silent comic just as a sort of... Um, an exercise in 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 the technical technicality of it uh, but this was the perfect opportunity i didn't really expect it to be as long as it was when i first had the idea i figured it was just going to be a one shot uh, and then the the sort of fable of it all started to come together and, and as is often the case with these big world building projects that the, the story sort of starts to suggest itself 
and it quickly became clear that when you when you set yourself the the mission of trying to depict quite a um quite a complicated emotional relationship between two characters without a single recognizable word being spoken you can do a lot more plot stuff than than would seem to be the case at first anyway long story short it ran away with us and we loved every minute of it that there are sort of as a writer there are two different sorts of comics there's the ones which it's like pissing razor blades you know it's like you have to really work at it you don't look forward to sitting down to writing an issue of it and some of those can be really really good like i'm doing a a, a comic for boom at the moment called damn them all with charlie adlard uh, on art and i'm so proud of it it's really good it's quality stuff charlie's done an amazing job the whole team's great but it's fucking hard it's it's like you know shitting a leg some days sitting down to write it whereas things like step by bloody step and not just because i'm not writing dialogue but because it just sort of flows it's one of those projects that just sort of gushes out of you gosh that's not a nice word is it let's never say that again but yeah it just sort of falls out of you and um and it's a joy and and both of those extremes can produce extremely good or extremely bad comics but obviously as a writer it feels like a holiday to do one of these versus one of these so yeah that's that's step by bloody step it was great. I, I felt like, um, you know, you didn't need the dialogue at all to follow the story and know everything that was happening in the art for it was just spot on, beautiful. Incredible, and it's, uh, it? it's interesting because I think your your dialogue is like one of the things that drew me to you and like to keep following you back, like uh, with your projects that you keep doing is because your dialogue is like top tier compared to others. Thank and uh, to to take what I felt was your strongest, uh, well, your strength out of the book altogether and just try it anyway and, it, and it's still knocked out of the park it was it was great man it has been said i mean i, I have a reputation in in the industry as a very wordy writer so it, it sort of the, the irony is not lost on me that the the book that got everybody to sit up and pay attention is the one with no fucking words in it at all. <laughs> That was uh, coming into my next question. I, I really enjoyed, uh, I think we got one or two pages of script in the in the end of um, the Step by Bloody Step trade. I'm, I've got my fingers crossed if you do a hardcover to get more of that because I really enjoyed seeing the the breakdown of the script to, to the art and, you know, the finished project. It's um, really fun to see. I mean, one of the really nice things about those four little pages, you can see... Uh, when I first started writing it, like issue one, I was being quite precise about what I wanted Matty to draw, how many panels on the page, blah, blah, blah. And then by the time that we're on issue four, because of this sort of spooky synergy we have, I was giving very little detail. So there's that last page, which we included. The action in the script was, I forget exactly, but it's something like... Uh, the girl comes to a group of feral creatures which may or may not look a bit like wolves and she tries to fight them off with her she's carrying this big sort of severed gauntlet and it's too heavy for her she can't do it so she tries to escape and she gets away from them and continues on her way um and matthias just took that and turned it into like one big page of her sliding down <laughs> like tobogganing on the yeah. and, and that's the sort of additive joy you can get when the collaboration is working because he's said everything that i need him to say but he's made it better and that's that's all you can hope for in a collaborator yeah so was uh this the script a lot more detailed or less detailed to uh, any other script you've written i mean hell uh most scripts i write are very very detailed and, and partly that's a product of um not always knowing who i'm going to be working with that's the nature, especially work for hire. You work for the big two. You're probably on issue four before you even know who's been assigned to draw the first issue. So yeah. um, I'm, I'm quite precise, but I always preface every script with a little thing saying, whoever you are, welcome aboard. Please understand that it's not my job to tell you what to draw. It's my job to tell you what it looks like inside my head. So yeah. everything you see here is just suggestion. It's not diktat. You can go ahead and do your own thing. If you have a better solution, by definition, your visual imagination is better than mine. So just roll with it. Most of the time it works. Occasionally there's a real, a real fuck up, which is always really depressing. And, and it's also, it's, it can be a bit awkward because, um, 
I love language. That will not come as a surprise. So my scripts are quite um, flowery, I guess. I like to use the right word for the right moment. And then more often than not, especially with the big two, if you find yourself working with somebody for whom English is not their first language, it's all getting translated anyway, and a lot of the nuance gets lost. So you just sort of have to suck that up and and use what comes in. So you're you're playing part screenwriter, part editor, because you're you're sort of going back in afterwards and and rewriting dialogue, and in some cases reordering pages to to make things make the most beautiful sense. Um, generally, it works. Not always. That was uh, going to be one of my questions. We could go into that. Is uh, it doesn't sound like you always get the chance to cr uh, choose your creative partner, but when uh, when you do get the chance, what do you what do you look for in um, your collaborative partner? I mean, it's it's a great question. I wish there was a simple answer. It sort of depends on the project, I guess. Uh, for instance, if I wanted to do uh, like a gritty, hard boiled crime thing then I probably wouldn't automatically gravitate towards Matthias. Whereas I know he'd do it amazingly, but I also know that what he wants to draw is insanely imaginative, no holds barred fantasy stuff. So, so you know, to an extent you tailor your creator own work towards the artist you want to work with. In fact, I'm now now in the habit of, if I want to work with somebody, the first, the first thing I ask them is, what, what have you always wanted to draw? Because it's my job to come up with ideas and I can do that without too much trouble. But if I go to somebody and say, Hey, I've got this really overwrought thing and the story's all written and the ends here, and this is what happens. Will you draw it for me? They've got every right to say, it's not really my cup of tea, mate. Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, it just sort of, it depends on the story and who you've got access to. There's a lot of, this is not a this is not a pleasant truth and it, like there's that question everybody asks how did you get in what's the best advice you can give to somebody who wants to get into writing comics and all the sort of stock answers are right you should read enough you should keep practicing you should do all of those things but the one that nobody really talks about because it's not it, it doesn't feel like a fair answer but i think it's real is that you have to build a network you have to you have to surround yourself with people who are doing similar or adjacent or contingent stuff so that you've got, apart from anything else, a sort of sounding board, people who can tell you things about your work. But more importantly, when the big break comes, it won't come from above. It'll come from sideways. It'll be because somebody you know has got a gig and they're looking for somebody to collaborate with and they come to you. And it's somebody you've known for years who likes your work and respects you and thinks you'll be fun to work with. Um, so to answer your question, if I'm looking for somebody I want to work with for a specific story, I'm automatically limited by the people with whom I already have relationships. And it's, it's quite unusual that like if I set out to do a, a creator own story with artist X, who I've never met, never communicated with, love their work, they're in hot demand, I can get their email through a mutual friend, but the chance of that going anywhere is quite slim compared to it being somebody that I've had a beer with in a bar at some time or somebody I've been emailing back and forth for years. Um, so these are all sort of real politic reasons for choosing somebody or not choosing somebody and occasionally it's the artist who reaches out to the writer that's always quite nice <laughs> you don't always want to be the chaser um but yeah no the 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 single biggest answer is it depends on the project i want to talk about uh coda for a little bit now too because we've got the uh coda starting again and i'm like really excited to to jump back in the world of coda and uh, the, the world of coda is so big and it feels lived in for years and years how do you go about creating a world like that before you even start writing the story? Um, like code, funnily enough, code is a cheat because the the sort of the the joke, if you like, the gimmick with Coda is that to to take a couple of steps back for those who don't know, Coda is uh, a story set in a post-apocalyptic version of a high fantasy world. So it is to world of Warcraft as Mad Max is to the real world. You know, in, in the Mad Max verse, uh, everything's gone wrong. There's no oil, currency has devalued, everybody's reverted to sort of roaming savage bands, blah, blah, blah. In 
in CODA, we look back to a time of like high fantasy castles and kings and dragons and people waving pennants and paladins. And it's all gone away. There's been this huge war. The Dark Lords won and all the magic has gone. There's there's very little magic left. It just sort of exists as these little dregs of, of sort of distilled, liquefied magic, which people fight over. So in terms of world building, world building the backstory is effortless because I just have to think about like, the silliest excesses of high fantasy, all the sort of really dumb, overly baroque, wanky, elfy, fucking nonsense that comes out of that genre, which takes itself so seriously and is so utterly po-faced and creatively moribund. And then we have a lot of fun just going, right, fuck you, kill it, bury it in the ground, see what sort of weird rot grows on it and then dig it back up again and see what that looks like. And that's, that's Coda like at its heart. And this is, this is where the waffle begins with apologies. Like in general terms, my approach to world building is create your world, make it as complicated as you want. Ideally make it functional because there's nothing worse than a story that relies on a world that has been created solely for the benefit of the story. Like if, if, when your story ends, the world no longer continues, then that's a bad world in my view. Whereas if your world and your story are overlapping, but not contingent on one another, then that's already interesting. So create a world, set your story within it, but then push your world into the background. Nobody wants to read fucking Star Wars crawls about how the world works and fiddly with like I mean clearly I'm wrong about this because every fantasy book starts with a map and like I write X-Men comics and you can't move for all the data pages so there's a sort of mentality of the fan that loves this stuff my fear is that it's a bit like in fan in fiction terms detail acts a bit like entropy in the real world in the sense that the more detail you permit your readers or your consumers the harder it is to create good stories because it's becoming so ossified everything's becoming so pinned down on the page that you can't help paint yourself into the corner you can't really surprise anybody anymore so it's it's to be resisted in my view like we we sort of joked around about this in the first volume of coda because we started with the big map and then you put the next page over it and it's this sort of overlay of what the world looks like now and it's just a mess you know so so there's a lot of fun to be had there but yeah coda you you take that world you push it into the background and then you focus on what matters and in the case of coda it's the main character and eventually his wife and the fact that they have this very lived in relationship that's quite complicated and is predicated upon the fact that they unquestionably love each other and yet they are frequently lying to each other about stuff and frequently lying to themselves about stuff and that all feels very human and yet it's dropped in this ridiculous epic backdrop of rotting dragons and unicorns with five horns and mermaids who live in tanks and, and you can just sort of like that's the stuff that matthias excels at you know i can focus on the interaction between these two characters and say just fill the background with crazy and he's off and that's that's his joy um yeah i think that's that's the trick with coda is to sort of for me to focus on the i'm going to sound like such a prick emotional honesty of the the main characters while matthias is just sort of splurging his imagination all over the place god gushing splurging i'm all over it today <laughs> coda is seriously one of my favorite stories like ever i had to Thank double dip uh, for the hardcover, even though I, I have all the trades and it's, it's beautiful just seeing the art on these nice big pages as well. And it's I love so that great. we've got a nice uh, picture here of the, the pentacorn. He's, yeah, nice. he's such a great character and he has such a filthy mouth. Um, <laughs> well, probably all we've I'm ever wondering... seen is the Grawlix, right? <laughs> we don't know <laughs> what he really says. Yeah. But uh, yeah, what, what, what my imagination fills in anyway, it's pretty filthy. <laughs> Um, how, how do you think of a, a pentacorn and why did you give it a, a filthy mouth? I just thought like unicorns have become so unfairly 
sanitized. Uh, I saw, I couldn't think of anything fun. Like the main character shows up and he's riding on a unicorn and everybody rolls their eyes. We've seen this a thousand times. And then it's this bloodthirsty mutant unicorn with horns sprouting in all wrong directions that's addicted to liquid magic and all it ever says is swear words it just runs around yelling it just made me giggle <laughs> that's the sort of <laughs> the sort of starting point for something like coda it's quite interesting we i don't know how public this is but and i probably shouldn't name names but we came very close to getting coda set up as a tv show um and it, it sort of jumped through all the hurdles and a pilot was commissioned by somebody who's quite well known and and it, it, oh, it sort of nearly made it um and it was really interesting seeing the transition from the page into a uh, into a screenplay because of course on the screen you can't get away with the unicorn just yelling symbols yeah and i think the the writer's approach was to make them sort of quite imaginative quite creatively purple swear words and it sort of worked but I, yeah i'm glad i wasn't given the task of adapting it because i would have just been <laughs> filling it with obscenities that wouldn't have got past the censor um yeah that was a near miss are you excited to to jump back in the world of coda it's not i think it's not long september it comes out is it? no no we're well underway i'm i'm up to i've just turned in issue three matthias is drawing issue two so yeah i think it i think it begins again in september the, the sort of the way it's a it's a five issue series this time a little bit longer each issue is longer the the way that i i mentally position it is um you remember firefly the the tv show there was like there was the whatever it was it was only two seasons in the end wasn't it and then they did mm. that movie yeah serenity is that right yeah or have i got the wrong way around yeah so it's sort of the same in the sense that the first block of coda is quite long and now this new one is a sort of more refined it's a different story it's i guess you could call it a sequel but it's it's more like a, a sort of new story with the same characters that takes place in the same world continuation of stuff so they don't they don't hinge upon one another. You don't desperately have to have read the first thing to to pick up this new one. Um, I think it works. It feels like a nice progression to go from this big sprawling introduction to this far more sort of status quo-y something comes along to shake the status quo and what are we going to do about it? And there's some really cool ideas in there, um, which I'm quite fond of. Uh, so yeah, yeah. To answer your question again, I'm waffling on about stuff other than actually answering your question. To answer your question, it's a joy. It's a real joy to go back to that world. Awesome. I'm really, really looking forward to it. Me too. Uh, with with Coda getting a sequel, what other of your um, creator and work would you like to get back into the world of and, and see another sequel? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, all of it. That you, you can't do. It's not true. I was about to say you can't do a creator-owned story without half thinking about what what a sequel would look like, but that's not always true. There are some things which are very much done in one. Um, I'm doing a, a crime thriller uh, mini series at the moment, which we're putting out through Image with an artist I won't tell you because it's not been announced yet. But that's very much a done in one, no sequel. But then things like The Spire, Alienated, um, Cry Havoc they've all got the sort of the the possibility of a sequel built into them it's a it's a bigger question about the difference between mini series and, and ongoing series i suppose I, I tend to shy away from ongoings in the sense that i'm quite keen on the kind of controlling idea this this um beautiful kernel of moral or ethical or or whatever it is wisdom which your story keeps coming back to. And that's very easy to sustain as long as you know where the story ends. But if you're constantly spinning your wheels, it gets a lot harder to be that um, efficient and that elegant. So the, the, the model of the sort of seasonal model with sequels is much more useful to me creatively because I can tell a story that comes to an end as with Coda, and then we can tell a new story with a beginning and a middle and an end as with the new Coda. Um, I'd love to go back to Angelic. It sort of is a funny book, Angelic. I was so proud of it, and it, it sort of went under the radar a little bit. Oh, um, yeah, it, I, I, can we kind of struggle to figure out how to market it, I think. 
Like, I think it works best if it's aimed at the sort of 12 to 16 year old market. Um, but we made it so that it was hopefully good for adults as well. And it's, it's fun for younger kids, but that's a really difficult bracket to market to. And of course, me being me, I filled it with slightly difficult, wanky neologisms and sort of made up languages and, and stuff, which, which automatically makes it a little bit impenetrable on the first page. I'm pretty sure a lot of people picked it up and went, oh, this makes no sense and put it back down again. <laughs> um, it's supposed to be about flying monkeys and instead it's about young females being married off and having their wings cut off. And, and that's the sort of like, I like the idea of burying really important um, social, moral stuff inside what appears to be a sort of silly, funny animal story. Um, but I guess readers don't agree. <laughs> but but no, we had a we had a whole sequel for that all mapped out, involving uh, tan coloured orcas that swim through the sand of a desert, and uh, like a a warrior orangutan which rides around on a giant crab with this sort of stool that swivels sideways so that when the crab wants to walk sideways, you can be facing in the right direction <laughs> when it goes. I've actually pinched that idea for the new season of Coda. So Matthias has been drawing that very thing. That's that's uh, Hum's wife, Circa. She rides around on exactly that giant land crab now. So yeah. never an idea goes goes to waste. I have my fingers crossed on uh, one day that, that sequel coming because... Uh, be nice, yeah, I would love that. That was a... Uh, a, a fun adventure but with like pretty pretty heavy stakes as you're going through it yeah it was yeah. A, a great art too i love the cat the cat was my favorite yeah casper's really great the old the phase cat yeah casper's another mate who who sort of keeps coming back around who i'll always work with whenever he's free he's he's very popular with the the sort of the british crowd dan and alex and ram and co so he's uh he's in hot demand it's funny, I'm just looking at the, the background on the screen and remembering things I've read. <laughs> like alien, <laughs> alienated is one, for instance, that I'm beyond proud of, but that is very much one that it doesn't get a sequel. It's a it's a thing and it finishes and we all step away from it and go, holy shit, that was intense. Let's never go back there, but but we can all be very proud of it. With uh, talking about ongoing, so you're going to be on, on the new ongoing coming up soon with The Flash, right? Mm -hmm. It's also started in September. What yep. can you what can you tell us about jumping on the flash? Very daunting. Uh, it's the first time I've been given given a, a character of that sort of stature. That that I mean, I I don't want to jinx it by saying it'll definitely go past six issues. But you know, unless I really really fuck it up, which is not not impossible, it'll probably go past six issues. So um, you do automatically have to find new strategies for telling those stories years ago when i was first writing uh x-men legacy my my then editor daniel ketchum who's a wonderful guy he used to have this term for for a thing called claremonting which is where you just deliberately throw in stuff that may or may not become important and you don't necessarily have to know whether it's important or not it's just when i need it i've got a plot over there when i need it i've got a plot over there so to an extent, I'm doing that. I do know where all these things go for a change, but it's it's a question of how much runway we get to to tell all these different stories. And the the big challenge. This is the first time I've talked about this in an interview, so I'm I'm not quite as as sort of organised mentally as I normally am about these <laughs> things. But it, it's um, I don't know if you read the the previous run, Jeremy's run. It's really really good. It's like as as polished and wonderfully characterful as a classic um, speculative sciencey superhero tale can be. You know, it, it, it doesn't break the mold because it doesn't need to. It's just really, really good, solid superhero stuff. And inevitably when when they bring me in and they're like hey Cy, si, what would you do if you could do anything with a flash and I'm like horror needs to be psychedelic horror because of course it does you've got this guy uh, in fact a whole bunch of them who dip into this mysterious force that they don't really understand anything about which gives them these powers which allows them to transcend reality and occasionally break the the light barrier and it, it's just perfectly set up for 
spooky psychedelic shenanigans as people tear down the veil and see what strange things reality holds that you you have no suspicion of expecting them to come back and say that sounds great that's a black label book isn't it so we're going to go with <laughs> the other thing and instead they say yeah we want to do this um and i think i mean i haven't had this conversation so i'm speculating my guess is when you've got but Jeremy's run was, I think, 36 issues, so three years. That's incredible in, in today's world. You've got the movie coming out. I guess someone somewhere thought to themselves, if we're not going to shake it up now, whenever will we? Do you know what I mean? The, the time yeah. is right. But it's, it's daunting because the fans are rightly very fond of the, um, the, the sort of family web of relationships that became so important in Jeremy's run. The fact that Wally West, the central character, has all these sort of loved uh, friends and family and kids and his wife and all of his other sort of Flash family stuff. You know, it's it's called a, the Flash family for a reason. It's a family book. And if I come along and I'm just like, nah, fuck all that stuff. We're going to tell spooky tales about this guy rupturing the reality barrier and delving into strange planes of existence, then they will rightly be a bit fed up. So it's been about finding clever ways to sort of do both, to have the cake and eat it, to keep the focus on Wally as a, an interesting human and therefore a human who exists in a network of, of interpersonal relationships while also gradually tightening the screws on this sort of mysterious stuff that's going on in the in the the sort of periphery of his world so we don't jump straight into uh, a kind of spooky ooky vibe we kind of get there bit by bit with letting it like the, with the tentacle is the obvious thing, you know, it's the fucking Lovecraftian nonsense and cliches. And we're trying very hard to stay away from tentacles for that result, for that reason. But to use the language of the tentacle, it's the tentacles creeping in and wrapping themselves around everything before you even notice. So that by the time you realize something's going a bit wrong, it's too late. All the same, like we come in in the middle of a superhero fight with Gorilla Grodd, you know, it's that that's the sort of we're hitting the, the big fun bold beats while gradually increasing the shadows that are falling across things again i'm waffling but yeah that's there's a lot to talk about with the flash and i haven't quite finished processing it because i'm still still sort of finding my feet i'm writing issue four at the moment and um i think i've got wally's voice i'm finding the other voices as i go but this is the difference between the, the mini series and the ongoing is that you can take your time. You can sort of say, you know what, my outline had this happening here, but I think it's more important that we spend a bit of time with that character. So let's do that instead. And that's quite nice. That's an unusual luxury for me up until the point that my editor calls me and say, you know what, we need to wrap it up, go. <laughs> and that's when the headaches start. But yeah, for now, yeah. it's a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to it. I've got it uh, pre-ordered. Um, September looks like a, a busy month for you because you've also oh, yeah. got uh, Uncanny Spider-Man uh, yeah, coming up. A, a, a mini series. This one. What can you tell us about this Night Nightcrawler as Spider-Man? I'm I'm intrigued. It's a it's a lot of fun. So the the way that this had to be. So again, two steps back. Uh, the X Men have been going through a very unusual years long phase we call it the krakowan era they've got their own nation they're sort of a superpower on the political stage um that's all going through some of its biggest crises very soon inevitably after three years of this massive paradigm changing status quo ignoring stuff new readers are going to be like well i kind of want to jump aboard but do i have to read three years of stuff so the challenge when coming up with a new book is always to find the ways that it can be immediately enjoyed but which also pays a lot of respect to all that stored up 
fictional energy and which progresses the story in a certain way. So I've spent the last two years telling stories with Nightcrawler that are all very strange and I think quite good. Um, but we don't desperately need to have read them to have come to this point. What we need to know is that he's been framed, sort of framed for a series of murders and he's on his own. He's an outlaw. And for reasons that will become clear in the book, one of the ways that he thought it would be clever to hide out while still being useful is to pull on a spidey mask and bamf around New York. Now, what's actually going on is that he's just having fun. Like for the first time in his life, he's a character who's well known for being thoughtful, spiritual. Um, he's always prepared to self-sacrifice for any reason. He's he's like one of the most good decent, purely righteous humans in all of comicdom. And the irony being that he looks the least human out of all of those characters. And yet now he's sort of swinging around Manhattan, saving people from muggers, swashbuckling, just having fun. And that's great because that's something I've never been able to write before. I've never been given the opportunity because people see my name and they think he's that weirdo 1990s vertigo cerebral guy let's give him the horror stuff let's give him the wanky religious nonsense <laughs> so for a change i get to write the the sort of the big dumb bold heroing stuff that said it being me and I, I don't know that this has ever been done before so i'm quite proud of this it gradually becomes clear that he's using street level superheroing as a displacement mechanism it's it's essentially without going too far into spoiler territory it's a story about post-traumatic stress and what you do when you're traumatized and in a world like marvel with a character like nightcrawler one thing you can do when you're traumatized is swing around manhattan beating up muggers <laughs> and that's that seems like a smart bit of therapy for him but of course it can't last so it's a story about escaping from responsibility and embracing responsibility and the different ways that you can try to help the world you can either help it on the micro level or you can uh embrace a sort of broader um polity level responsibility which is what he's running from so anyway again waffle 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 um there's lots of bamfing there's lots of punching there's lots of sexy times um and there's lots of pizza. So yeah, it's it's a real giggle. That's great. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, another one of my favorites uh, that you, oh, you've done hello. is uh, Dr. Apra. And this is easily the, the greatest Star Wars character to be created in like the last decade and a half, maybe. And uh, yeah, it's gotta, it's gotta be amazing being able to add to the lore of uh, the, the best Star Wars character in a long time, right? Yeah, it was a real treat. It was a real treat. And uh, like Kieran was so gracious. He he knew, I forget how much of it he did in the end. I think he did the first six or first five, maybe, before he he was doing a whole bunch of other stuff and he knew he couldn't keep going. So he brought me aboard and the first arc I did, he and I co-wrote the the first issue of that arc. And then the rest of it I wrote, but we we were like we we're emailing backwards and forwards to make sure that I was on the right. Uh, the right lines. Yeah, she's a a lot of fun because complicated, and that's that's sort of the, the the ideal with a comic character. I think is that on the surface they appear quite simple, and then you you peel off the skin, and uh, below there's an awful lot of nuance. It's the reason I love John Constantine. It's the reason I love Hum from Coda. There's characters who just sort of work on those two quite distinct levels. Afra appears to be this quite shameless, self-serving, self-absorbed accumulator of wealth and power uh, and sex. And she is, she's all of those things. Um, but she'll probably feel bad after she stabbed you in the back, which is the sort, that's the, the kind of the redeeming guilt that you can focus in on. And you can just about guess that below the surface there is this very lonely person who would love it if she were able to build some sort of sustainable network 
but she just can't do it because she's like the the fan term was disaster lesbian she's a disaster lesbian everywhere she goes <laughs> everything goes wrong so it would be cruel of her to stay in one place for too long and to fall in love with anybody for too long so she just sort of goes through life like this wrecking ball causing chaos around her occasionally she manages to show these little glimmers of some sort of altruism or empathy but it never lasts long and that's a fascinating character and bastards who know their bastards are the very best characters because you're always waiting for them to just acknowledge it or to try and redeem and they sometimes get a little bit of redemption but it never lasts very long and that's that's like crack because you just keep coming back for more <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I absolutely love uh, Doc Jaffer. I, I can't imagine how uh, exciting it would be to, to write for her. It's really great. I've got a, a GLAAD award on my shelf downstairs, thanks to thanks to Afro. It was the first gay kiss in any Star Wars media, I think. Uh, I might be wrong about that. But yeah, no, it was it was quite a big moment. And I love the idea that sort of arose from that, that in the Star Wars universe, like sexuality just isn't a thing. Nobody really cares about it or worries about it. Yeah. So for all of its problems, that's a sort of utopian galaxy in that one, in that one way. I just want to ask you what what does the 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 medium of comic books mean mean to you as a writer? I mean, it's uh, it has personal stored up meaning for me because it's it's the one that I sort of first first found publishing through so on a very selfish level it's always going to have that sort of special nostalgia for me but on a, a broader slightly sort of slightly wankier level it's it's i mean it really is magic like, without going down an alan moore route too far because he does it a lot better than i i do although he's right the the specific um the specific way that a v purely visual and static medium can cause your brain to generate the illusion of time passing but to do it in a way that makes no fucking sense you know you can have a, here's a panel it's got four different people talking in it and a sound effect and an, a moment a frozen moment of somebody being shot these things cannot reconcile. This is a static image that has multiple different speeds and velocities of uh, time related things happening in it. And then once your mind has been able to stitch all these things together in such a way that they make sense, you then are faced with this empty gutter, which your brain has to jump over to try and match up to whatever's in the next panel. And this is all happening silently unconsciously and very very fast and that's using up a ton of your unconscious power and it it follows that when you reach a beat in a story in a comic that is powerful your brain is working so fucking hard it hits twice as hard as it would hit in any other medium where you're being given more or less of any particular element and I, I truly believe that that's true. I, I believe that you can you can hit readers much harder than you can a like the best movies versus the best comics, video games, all these different mechanisms for storytelling use different versions of received and perceived information, the, the way that your brain is required to decode everything. But comics is the only one that mixes them all up in this patchwork of received and perceived gratifications and your brain's really working hard. And, and that's quite, quite remarkable. And that's before you even get into the whole, the magic of collaboration, the magic of two different people's visions getting all tangled up with each other and being greater than the sum of their parts, the magic of shared universes. Like I could go on, but it's it, as a, as a tool in a storyteller's box, it's, pluripotent it's it's absolutely astonishingly wonderful um pissy spurrier side note it is therefore tragic how utterly shit 
an awful lot of comics are because they're not making the most of this. They're doing the same shit over and over and over again um, when they could really be pushing. Like, to, I mean, I'm, I'm often waffling, sorry, but uh, like step by bloody step, we talked about it earlier on. When we discovered this, we had no expectation of it. We discovered that when you show a silent comic, whatever that means, because all comics are silent, but a, a, a comic that has no text in it, to a reader, they have to read it quite differently. And, and here's what I think happens. When you pick up a, a standard comic, the brain and the eye jumps immediately to the text in the first panel, and it reads it, and then it holds it in the forefront of its mind while it investigates the imagery around it to try and confirm or juxtapose or to sort of make some sort of sense out of these two different things. And then when it's done that, it hops onwards and it tends to hop onwards into the next text in the next panel. And that's the constant process. When there is no text anywhere on any page, the brain gets a little bit confused. It's like, what the fuck am I doing? I've got no navigation. I've got no guiding star. So every single panel is an investigation. Why has the artist decided to show me this? There's a picture of a hand. Why is there a hand in this? What does that mean? I'm going to check the next panel and see if that, exp oh, the hand's reaching for a flower. Okay, that, that makes some sense. Every single little thing has to be decoded in a way that causes the brain to work even harder than I was waffling about earlier on. And it's so exhausting, <laughs> unconsciously, that we realized if we didn't every now and then throw in a big double page splash of just nothing, like a beautiful landscape or some footsteps in the snow, if we didn't do that, people couldn't get more than five or six pages into it before going, OK, taking a break. <laughs> and that's remarkable. You know, that's that's something that most people don't. You, you wouldn't stand up and leave after five minutes at the beginning of a movie because it's a bit tiring to watch this. You know, maybe you would. But anyway, it's it's a remarkable medium and we barely scratch the surface of what it can do. That's a that was a beautiful answer. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry to want to end the last 13 minutes of this interview with a, a, a silly writing game. Oh, I love silly such writing a, games. After such a beautiful, thoughtful answer, <laughs> but I'm I'm gonna give it a, a red hot shot. Um, so I've, I've just got six uh, questions for you. They're all, all a bit silly. Take them uh, how you want to. All right. But the the first question is a bit of a challenge. More so, uh, could you please write a sentence without using a or e in any of the words? A or e. Mm -hmm. Can I write this down? Of course. Hang on. This is going to be a long and awkward silence for you. So enjoy staring <laughs> at the top of my head. Hang on. A or E. Uh, this is. No, that's got an A in it. This is highly foolish. This is highly foolish. <laughs> Perfect. That was great. <laughs> uh, my, my second question, um, if Boom Studios asked you to help Keanu Reeves write a comic book and the only idea that he had for it was a guy going berserker in a field, how would you expand on that idea to get a 12-issue series? A guy going berserk in a field? Mm -hmm. uh, fuck me. Uh... I mean, I would probably, this, this is the way that my brain would go. It would start by interrogating the word berserk and like the kind of the connotation, the Norse men who used to, you know, take hallucinogenic drugs and chew on the edge of their shields before going into battle. I'd be reminded of, like, I don't know if you were ever into Warhammer, but there's like space Vikings called the, the Space Wolves, I think they were called. I say that as if they're in the past. I'm sure they're still out there. Um, yeah, I probably, I haven't read Berserker, so I don't know. Does that go into, like, future -y stuff, sci-fi stuff? Uh, it does a little bit, but I don't know. I think it might have fallen off a little bit. Yeah, and then, like, field, field's interesting because my brain would start thinking about, like, sports fields. I wonder if there's a sort of competitive, <laughs> you know, like, Berserk, some sort of two teams of raging, hallucinogenic, 
drug taking oh I, okay so here's what i would do i would pivot the story right so uh, yeah this is an interesting thing that i've been thinking about a lot recently you know how like sport competitive sport i don't give a single fuck about competitive sports sorry sports fans it's going through a bit of a long night of the soul at the moment because uh questions to do with gender are particularly hard to reconcile like we increasingly live in a world where we understand that identity and all its myriad forms generally adheres to spectrum rather than binaries and yet anything such as sport which exists solely by putting people into boxes you can't compete with you because you're different you can't compete with you it's going to struggle it's going to struggle more and more and more and probably good because it's silly <laughs> Here's what I would do. I would say everybody competes against everybody else. There's no boxes. But in order to allow everybody to compete at the same level, there are no restrictions on drugs, body modifications, <laughs> training, chemicals, anything. It's all game. And it becomes like a an arms race, an engineering arms race. And like we're already there with motorsports. Like if you watch Formula One, it's got a lot more to do with the people building the car than it's got to do with the dude who does this. And yet he's the famous one. So that's what I do. Berserker sport, anyone can enter. They can be as jacked up as they want. Uh, and they just let loose on each other. Maybe there's a ball. That's how I do it. Well, you... <laughs> that was amazing. Uh, I think we might have to... Fire Matt Kent, get him out of there, and <laughs> commission me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish we we could uh, have that berserker. Maybe you just need to hit up Keanu and tell him that you've got an idea. <laughs> uh, question number three: uh, Marvel wants you to create an X Men team that would be the next boy band sensation, like One <laughs> Direction or Backstreet Boys. Right. What characters would you put on the team, and what would the team be called? Oh fuck. I mean, purely because I can't hear the word One Direction without thinking of Wand Erection. It's got to be like all the all the young male magic users in one group, right, called One Direction. The problem is I don't know who all the young male magic users are. There's uh, like Wiccan, he's not even a mutant. Fuck, this is a bad question to ask somebody who pretends to know lots of mutants but actually doesn't. It's definitely got Chamber in it. It's definitely got Maggot in it uh let's just put all the strange ones in there uh who else is there's a character called anol i quite like he's the sort of lizardy guy who occasionally rips his arm off and it grows back bigger there's definitely a metaphor to be picked apart there but i'm not touching it with a barge pole right now <laughs> yeah who else is fun young boy do you know i don't really know I mean, let's let's start with those three. Rock slides quite fun as well. Rock slides are good. I wrote him long ago. I turned him into a giant piece of garlic to fight a vampire mutant. <laughs> God, comics are weird sometimes. Yeah, that'll do. Let's cut. So, One Direction, W A N D space Erection, um, fronted by some new magic using mutant who has a big wand. That's that's all you're getting at me for that one. That's a, an amazing answer. I, I hope we can, uh, if we pitch that onto Marvel together, maybe I could get I a bit of I don't think they'll go for that one. I think, I think Berserker, we've got a chance, but, uh, but <laughs> one direction, not so much. Uh, 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 question number four. How would you give a compelling backstory to a half-eaten donut left on the street? Oh, jeepers. Uh, uh, we shrink it down... There's a, a whole population of tiny people who live out of sight in the gutters and in the, the cracks of the bricks. And that was one of their homes. Or maybe it's like a lifeboat. That's it. Okay, so we turn it into like a... Um, it's a, a metaphorical commentary on immigration. Hot topic at the moment. Donuts are being used by desperate refugee fairies from the other side to smuggle themselves into our reality because there's no legitimate way through because all the like the earthly fairies are slightly fascist and they want to keep this world for themselves uh so donuts are actually life vessels like the little boats that are a big story here in the uk at the moment 
and over where you are right there's the whole is it christmas island they all get dumped on i yeah. forget that's a yeah 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 tragic story um anyway yeah that's got serious fast but let's do that let's make it a let's make it a, a commentary about refugee fairies using jam donuts to try and build a better life for their kids and instead being cruelly stamped on and eaten by the vicious fascist fairies who already occupy our reality. I n could have never thought that the answer for that question would go that route, but I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Uh, uh, question number five. Um, if you were in your your own comic, uh, God Shaper, and you had your very own God, what would you do mm -hmm. with it? What would you get your God to do? Oh, good question. I don't know. God Shaper was such a such a sort of strange and heartfelt story. Uh, I don't know. Like the things that I I feel I lack as a meat machine like i feel like i lack the button that allows me to go to sleep do you know what i mean like i was reading the other day the average time it takes somebody to go to sleep is seven minutes for me it's like 40 minutes on a really good night so that sort of stuff like i wouldn't want a god who could lift heavy things and turn shit into money that that's cheating i wouldn't be satisfied with that a god who could just help me do all the stupid things my body's already supposed to be able to do but can't like digesting wheat or <laughs> like going for a shit on demand rather than at exactly the inconvenient moment when i really need to be focused that sort of stuff it would be like a a funny so like it would it would look a bit like an outfit it would be a god that i wear like a sort of craven the hunter style jerkin with its head sort of behind my head and it would have its little tubes all connected to bits of my anatomy so that I could be like right well it's 9 30 a.m it's time for a five minute shit off we go and the <laughs> god do its little magic uh I need some sleep a nap on a train off you go bosh yeah all that sort of stuff that's that's what I want a god for to do the really tedious physical nonsense that I'm not efficient enough to do <laughs> That sounds like a, an amazing god. <laughs> uh, this is the, the sixth question, the final question here. And uh, it may surprise you, but uh, Marvel Comics did accept your, your pitch for One Direction, and now DC Comics is approaching you because they know you know how to create uh, bands, <laughs> and they want to create a girl band. Uh-oh. So they're, they're giving you free roster of all of their characters. It doesn't have to be just Amazonians or whatever. You can yeah. uh, choose any any female character for your girl band, but they want they want a girl band and they want you to name it. Fuck. I know even less about all that stuff than I know about Marvel's Merry Mutants. Um, let's see. Female. I mean... Like my brain immediately goes, do you remember like Saga of the Swamp thing? There's Abby Arcane, right? She'd be great in a band. And there's something about the word arcane, like R, R, okay, no, you can't use him. He's a male character. I was going to say like capital R, then word cane. You could use the old House of Mysteries cane. Maybe he's the mm -hmm. manager. That would be fun. Um, yeah, I just don't know enough about the sort of broader world in order to to speak to this in any clever way. Um, Jane could be like the meatloaf driving them around on the bus. Yeah, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Like, it's a lazy answer. We'll get all the play the hits like Catwoman. Maybe it's an animal theme. Catwoman. Tigra, is that a thing? Cheetah. Uh, Cheetah, yes, that one. Yeah, I'm glad that you read my mind. That one, yeah. Uh, yeah, and what would it be called? I don't know. Uh, there's got to be a pun to do with the words DC or um, the Amazons. No, it's a lame answer. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna end on a high note here. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm firing blind. Uh, That's all right. 
yeah, yeah. No, bring back One Direction, and I'll uh, I'll finish on a high note. <laughs> Simon, I, I cannot thank you enough for spending this hour with me and uh, sharing all your, your stories with your work and uh, entertaining me with some silly questions at the end there. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. And again, thanks for staying up so late. Go get some sleep, dude. <laughs> yeah, well, we have uh, Night, uh, Uncanny, Spider-Man, The Flash, and Coda all coming out in September. Did I miss anything else that you got coming out soon? Yes, I think so. So... Uh, the second season of Damn Them All begins, I think, also September. It's a big bloody month for me, is September. So that's that's uh, issue seven plus of Damn Them All. Um, there is another very big announcement coming, which I guess, I think maybe we announced that at New York in October, but that's a thing that I think is going to make a lot of people quite happy. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting something, but I can't remember. There'll be, there's the, the image series I mentioned before, the crime thing. I, I don't think we'll announce that until next year, probably at this rate, it's going quite slowly, but um, that's very exciting. Yeah, I think that's probably it. That's enough, right? <laughs> that's that's enough. Enough. Okay. <laughs> yeah, very, very busy guy, man. I, I really appreciate <laughs> you taking the time out to, to chat. And, oh, it's been a uh, great pleasure. Thanks heaps, man. Thanks everyone for watching. Thanks folks. <laughs>